morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Van Ryan, and um, Terry and I have been fellowshipping here for almost 10 years, and uh, played some roles, uh, playing the band sometimes, and uh, have uh, been on the elder team sometimes. And um, if you don't know me, you probably know Terry. I'm often introduced as, oh, yeah, he's Terry's husband. Uh, but interestingly, Terry and I met in the late 1970s at a place called Miami Christian College. Not Miami of Ohio, this was Miami, Florida. And uh, interestingly, she, she had made her way there from New England. And, uh, and I made my way there from the West Coast. And we met clear down here in Miami, Florida. So we have a lot of good memories from Miami Christian College and our, we both got degrees from there. Uh, this is kind of a random memory uh, to lead off our message this morning. Um, we had, there was probably like 300, 350 students uh, at any one time at Miami Christian College. And uh, we had some students that came from a Christian drug rehab called Turning Point. And uh, a few students from that, from that place. And one of them, his name was Jim Best. And I remember Jim telling us this story about how he got on a bus in South Florida. And you got you to gotta picture Jim... Um, as you know, the term hippie was kind of coined in the late 60s, early 70s. And this is the late 70s now. Uh, but Jim was the picture of the hippie, you know, ripping long hair, uh, facial hair, uh, bathing was pretty optional. <laughs> and um, so, so he gets on the bus and he sits down next to this uh, elderly lady. And they strike up a conversation as they're going on the bus ride. And, Along the way, he tells her that he's a Christian. And she looks at him, she says, you don't look like a Christian. <laughs> and he says, what does a Christian look like? And she says, well, I'm not sure, but it's not you. <laughs> and I remember at the time, you know, it was kind of humorous, him telling us this story and everything. But it really stuck in my mind, what does a Christian look like? And, and I did, at, at that time in my life, I did some pondering on that, some meditating on that, and gave some serious thought to what does a Christian look like. Well, today's text in Matthew, in some sense, answers that question. What does a Christian look like? Beginning at uh, verse 1 in our text, it's Matthew 5, and, um, and you're going through the first 16 verses. And in verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he, that is Jesus, went up the mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him. So this is where he's about to launch into the Sermon on the Mount. I had actually kind of forgotten how early in Jesus' ministry the Sermon on the Mount was. I mean, everybody is familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. But this was very early in his ministry. And probably the Sermon on the Mount is probably the most significant sermon ever given. Certainly the most significant speaker ever, ever so let's get the setting in our minds. Okay, this would take place actually on a Galilean hillside. And maybe the, maybe the 12 formed a circle around Jesus. Um, as we know from our uh, past teaching just last week, uh, Jesus had just selected um, his disciples. And then maybe farther down, there was a, a larger company of uh, other disciples. And then beyond them, a great multitude of just interested listeners. And the people listening to Jesus must have been absolutely astonished. They must have been spellbound. Because from the very beginning, Jesus was telling them that things, some things that seemed almost absurd. Like he was telling them, he was actually saying that not the rich, not the happy, not the well-fed, not the unoppressed were to be counted as well-off. But rather, it was the poor, it was the mourners. It was those who sought after righteousness. It was the persecuted who were actually the well-off. This was contradictory to what they would anticipate. And so here are the newly chosen 12 disciples, and here is Jesus just launching into his earthly ministry, and he begins to teach them what? He begins to teach them the foundation of discipleship. And so as I'm trying to picture what it must have felt like to be sitting there on that hillside and to hear Jesus. I remember back to when I was a new believer. 
I became a Christian in September of 1973, so just past 50 years. And less than a year later, in the fall of 1974, I had the opportunity to go to a one-year Bible school called Culver City Bible School in one of the delightful suburbs of Los Angeles. And um, so this was a, a very much like Ravencrest, okay? We had 68 students. I think there's probably some Ravencrest students in the room. Uh, same concept, we take a one-year intensive deep dive into scripture to kind of prepare you to then go on get your college degree or wherever you go from there. And so that's what it was, and here I was um, as a new believer. Now, one thing that's different about my experience than Ravencrest, um, you know, Matt commented on it earlier, the beauty of what surrounds us. Um, this is where Ravencrest is. Culver City, not so much. Probably the best way to describe it, uh, how many have seen the movie The Jesus Revolution? Anybody seen that movie? Okay. The, the Jesus Revolution movie, uh, the time space that that was in was from 1969 to 1972. And so I uh, went to CCBS in the fall of 1974. There's me and my roommate. Um, I'm the one on the right, um, and yeah, so that was a long time ago. I had hair, <laughs> which was kind of cool. Um, mine was short by comparison a lot. Uh, we used to uh, witness and, and um, share our faith in Christ in Westwood, which was where UCLA is. And uh, so, so 1974, the fall of 1974, and I have this opportunity to listen to great teaching. We had five great teachers and, um, and just really dig deep into the word of God. So I kind of picture, I thought about that and I thought about the parallels between this audience that Jesus Christ has for his Sermon on the Mount and, and where I was at that time. And so some of the parallels are hearing and understanding Jesus' teaching in some sense for the first time. And then there was, a, uh, there was a genuine hunger to learn. I know in, in, in my class, there was a genuine hunger to learn. There was the opportunity to hear and understand what a follower of Jesus Christ looks like, what he is, what he does. There was that astonishment um, in hearing his teaching. And then there was learning about the cost of discipleship. So the foundational teaching at CCBS would, would change my life forever. And I believe that Jesus' teaching at this moment would change the life of these disciples forever. So that's kind of the moment that we're in. And where Jesus starts is with the Beatitudes, which are really well known. And the, the Beatitudes, he teaches as the foundations for a life of authentic Christian discipleship. What are they? They're traits, qualities, behaviors. Uh, they're the character of a Christ follower. That's really what the Beatitudes are. And so we want to go through them. And for me, um, as I went through them, I try to picture, you know, there's the, you know, there's the poor in spirit. You know, there's the merciful. There, there, there's those that mourn. Each one of them, and there's eight of them, I try to picture somebody in my life experience who um, demonstrated that in my life. And so I would encourage you, as we go through each one of these, try to think of somebody in your life experience that demonstrated that, that character trait that we call the Beatitudes. So verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't pronounce these people blessed because they are poor in material goods, though many in the audience were. They are blessed because they are the ones who have become convinced of their spiritual poverty. They cry out from Luke 18, 13, O God, be thou merciful to me, the sinner. So I thought of, the first person I thought of was my grandfather, August Van Ryn. August Van Ryn was um, born in 1890 in the Netherlands. He was born into a family of uh, 11 children. And in 1907, he and four other brothers decided to come to America. So he was only 17. He was the youngest of the five. 
And um, he had to beg and plead with his mom and dad to let him go. But he came to the United States with his brothers, and they ended up, like many um, Dutch people did, in Michigan, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And not long after he um, came to the United States, uh, he became a believer. And then, um, during his early years there, and there was a, a surrounding of believers in that church fellowship where, where he fellowshiped with his brothers. And um, so they started developing him as one who could give his testimony, and then after that he could speak. And within six years, um, he was speaking at the, at the church. And then um, he was approached by a man who, who approached him with the opportunity to go and be on the mission field in the Bahamas. And there was a lot of uh, evangelistic meetings happening in the Bahamas, a lot of people coming to, to know Jesus Christ at that time. And um, so he went off on this adventure, and they eventually built their own boat and sailed from island to island and taught about Jesus Christ. And then he, um, out of that, um, he ended up in South Florida, where he raised his family, but he he preached his entire life until the day he died. Wrote many books, about 20, 20 different books. He wrote commentaries. You know, I looked at some of his stuff on Matthew in preparation for, uh, for this message. And he, he became convinced of his spiritual poverty. And as a result, he turned over not only his heart to Christ, but he turned over his life to Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, people mourn for many reasons, but in this text, the mourning is for those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. So here, so they recognize their spiritual bankruptcy, and then this mourning is not limited to what takes place because of a person's own individual sins. The disciples of Christ learn to love God to such an extent that they begin to weep and mourn for others, for the sins of many, not just for their own sins. The powerful surge of emotion that is expressed here in the second beatitude indicates a sorrow that begins in the heart, takes possession of the entire person, and is outwardly expressed. This thought caused me to think of somebody who many of you know, Rich Barlow. Um, Rich Barlow, for those of you who don't know him, um, served here as an associate pastor for many years, and uh, he's he lives down in the valley now. But prior to um, coming here, and and several years prior to coming and being on on the team, uh, Rich uh, struggled with addiction issues. Rich had a tough, tough life, and out of that, he was uh, wonderfully saved, and he had a deep faith and a deep care for people. When, and one of my best memories of um, Rich, one of my constant memories is whenever you would tell Rich about somebody, a need, it could be your own need, it could be a family member, it could be somebody that you knew. And uh, his immediate reaction would always be, oh, we need, let's pray. Let's pray right now. You could be standing in line at Safeway, you could be back here in the lobby, wherever you were. Rich wanted to pray immediately. Rich wept not just for his own sins, but for the sins of the many. Blessed are those who mourn. And then blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are those who humble themselves before God because they acknowledge their utter dependence upon him. And consequently, they are the gentle in their dealings with others. It describes the person who is not resentful, he bears no grudge. Um, this picture of the meek um, reminded me of a, a guy I knew down in Littleton by the name of Tom Grauman. Um, Tom, uh, if, you looked up, if you looked up meek in the dictionary, Tom's picture might be there. He was a very soft-spoken, uh, very meek man, but he had an incredible life story. Tom was born to uh, a Jewish family in Czechoslovakia in about 1931. And by 1939, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were overtaking, had taken over Czechoslovakia. He was systematically going after 
Jewish people, sending them off to concentration camps. Tom's mom saw that this was happening, was looking for a way to save her children. And there was a London businessman who happened to come to Prague frequently. He saw this need. He saw these children who were probably destined for death and wanted to do something. And he orchestrated families in the United Kingdom who would take these children. Uh, and he also orchestrated trains that would transport them from Prague to the families in the United Kingdom. It's a huge uh, undertaking. And he ended up saving 669 children out of Czechoslovakia before. Um, and there, there, it was on eight trains. There was to be a ninth train, um, but the Germans shut it down before that could depart. Tom was on the eighth train. He was eight years old. He would never see his little brother, who was supposed to be on the ninth train. He was sitting on the ninth train, but it never left the station. Or his mom, or his dad. They were all taken to concentration camps. But Tom went and lived with a family in Scotland. They uh, got him educated. He went to school and learned to be a nurse. Early on, in his teenage years, he became a Christian. And he wanted to serve Christ wherever he was. So he served um, as a nurse in the, for many years. That's where he met his wife. They uh, married, raised their family in Littleton, Colorado. That's where I met Tom, the church we used to go to in Littleton. And then, on top of that, he, um, he was able to, when um, Czechoslovakia was freed from communism and became the Czech Republic. This was in the early 90s. He had the opportunity to go back to Czechoslovakia and share his story. And the name of his story, as he told it, was called Twice Rescued Child. He's uh, written a book um, called Twice Rescued Child to tell that story now. But he went back for another 15 years, beginning in the early 90s, to tell that story to young people in the Czech Republic. Tom, blessed are the meek. He was gentle in his dealings with others. And then uh, the fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We cannot attain this righteousness on our own. Only those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. The righteousness imparted by God must be the object of intense desire, earnest yearning, and relentless pursuit. This caused me to think of, especially, especially the relentless pursuit, but all of it, caused me to think of a guy by the name of Alex Strauch. Alex Strauch uh, was the main teaching elder in Littleton Bible Chapel, uh, where Terry and I went for many years uh, down here in Littleton, Colorado. And um, I first heard him in about 1977. And he, he, was, he had an energizer personality, kind of the opposite personality of Tom Grauman. I mean, he just was constantly on the go. And, but he was, it was all about seeking the righteousness of God, teaching, whether it be teaching. He also was an author. He wrote many books. He, he wrote the exhaustive book on biblical eldership, about the only exhaustive book that's been written on biblical eldership that we um, teach as uh, as guys going to join the team of eldership here. And so Alex was definitely a, a person who hungered and thirst for righteousness and still is. He's still, uh, I was talking to somebody just this week, and um, he is now teaching at, uh, I think, the third satellite from, from Littleton Bible Chapel. So then, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy. The merciful are those who are conscious that they are themselves unworthy recipients of God's mercy. Mercy is love for those in misery and a forgiving spirit toward the sinner. It embraces both the kindly feeling and the kindly act. Some of you may know uh, Brian Schaefer. Brian um, is the director of Crossroads Ministry. And of course, Crossroads serves um, our neighbors in need here in Estes Park, but Brian, Brian has that merciful spirit about him. And you would think, well, it just kind of comes with the job, doesn't it? No. 
It's, it's more than that. Um, Brian, even when it doesn't fit within normal parameters, operating parameters at Crossroads, when he hears about a situation, he's always like, well, I know it's kind of outside what we normally do, but there's got to be something that we can do for these people. Uh, he, he has that character trait of being merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The pure in heart are the sincere and honest people, the men of integrity, those who act without hypocrisy. It is not surprising to read then that the pure in heart shall see God. They will spend time in his presence because to know God, one must be like him. I mentioned my year at CCBS, and we had five great um, professors. And one of them was a guy named Hugo Santucci. And Hugo Santucci, uh, to me, was a man who was uh, pure in heart. Um, I, I loved the teaching of all five of them. I probably got closest to Hugo because he, he discipled me every mon Monday morning for a whole year. Uh, I sat with, um, with Hugo, and, and he basically discipled me. And I admired him because he, he gave up a very successful career in the San Francisco Bay Area to come and teach young people, 68 students, some little school in Culver City, California, primarily the New Te Testament. But Hugo was one of those guys that when you were with him, you felt like you were closer to God because he spent so much time um, in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see God. You will see God in, as you seek to be pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The Lord was a true peacemaker, and yet on account of him, more strife and division have come into the world than one can grasp, which is so because the natural man rejects God's peace. Believers, too, often are considered troublemakers as the servants of God. But in reality, we're true peacemakers. I thought of several peacemakers. My sister is a peacemaker. Now, she had six children, so it, it's going to come with that, probably, uh, being a peacemaker. But beyond that, she was kind of always the peacemaker in our family as well. But my mind mostly went to Billy Graham. You know, Billy Graham... Uh, there were 12 consecutive presidents of the United States invited Billy Graham to come to the White House. And um, I don't know what the motivation was for, for each one of them, um, but I rather think that for most of them it was because Billy Graham brought the peace of God with him when he came into the Oval Office or wherever, wherever they met. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then the last beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is of heaven. The persecution that Jesus is referring to here is distinctly a persecution for righteousness sake. Because those who endure persecution continue to hold out under it no matter what happens to them. And of course this caused me to think of um, Dioffer. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, his story. And again it goes back when um, the Nazis were taking over Germany and other countries. I mentioned Czechoslovakia, Poland, many other countries. And so it was during that time period, and um, Bonhoeffer was a German pastor. He was also an author, probably most well-known for his awesome work, The Cost of Discipleship, uh, but many other, many other works. And so as this was happening in his home country, and, uh, and it, as it became clear um, that uh, Nazism was the enemy and, and Hitler. Uh, he became a dissident, Bonhoeffer did. Uh, he was even um, involved in a plot uh, with other dissidents to somehow move Hitler. Um, he was captured, he was sent to the concentration camps, and eventually to Flossenburg, where his life was taken from him. Sad, just about two weeks before the Allies liberated Flossenburg. Um, but he paid the ultimate price, and he influenced many others to stand for Christ, both through his life and through his writings. He's quoted many times. I had not heard this quote before, but he said, silence 
in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Bonhoeffer spoke and he acted. He stood up for Christ and he's uh, inspired many others to do that. Then continuing our text in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you false on my account. Rejoice and be glad. The reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only are those who suffer for suffer abuse for their abiding faith in Jesus called blessed, but they are also told to rejoice and be filled with unrestrained suffering. You know, why should I be that joyful in suffering? And uh, there are at least three, three reasons in Scripture. One, because the persecution indicates the character of, of your faith, 1 Peter 4.13. Uh, also, because Christian character is made mature through suffering in Romans 5.3. And then because persecution is followed by great reward in heaven in Romans 8.18. 8, Remember that today there are those around the world being persecuted for their faith in Christ. Um, I think of Vietnam and, and uh, Myanmar. Um, our sister Mark could tell you real life stories of persecution that's happening in those countries and around the world. And so now uh, the two fours, salt and light, describe the opposite. That is the response of Christ's followers to those who persecute them. In verse 13, we read, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet has many characteristics, but it's also, it, but it's, it's preservative power that is emphasized here. That's why salt is mentioned here. And just in the same way, Christians, when they're truly living out their faith, are constantly combating moral and spiritual decay. God knows how bad it would really be without Christians holding back some moral and spiritual decay. Uh, but thankfully, uh, that believers are here, and as we follow Christ and, and are that salt to the degree that just by his spirit, that power, um, we help to hold back uh, that moral decay. So many people, the Bible, are constantly reading us, right? Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The followers of Christ must be both visible and radiant. They must be in the light and also must send out rays of light. This first idea, it conveys a city situated on a hill. Such a city cannot be hidden. It's clearly visible to everyone. And then the second idea is this figure of a lamp set on the lampstand. Such a lamp gives light. These are pictures of what we, as we follow Christ, as we take on these characteristic traits of being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, the impact that we can have on the world out there. I mentioned my grandfather earlier in his commentary on Matthew, and I also mentioned that he sailed from island to island, so he did a good bit of sailing. And he said, an ordinary oil lamp can be seen for 10 miles or more at sea and guide many a vessel to port. That's how powerful that light can be. So we've just heard Jesus' teaching on living a life of authentic Christian discipleship. And I want to leave you with just a couple takeaways. One is, and this may, this may hurt a little bit, what is it they say in the gym? No pain, no gain. Uh, you know, Mike Caldwell probably says that. He's, he's a gym rat. Or he's heard it at least. You know? So as we were teaching through the Beatitudes, and I asked you to think one who exed, exuded each of those characteristics, see yourself in any of those. Okay, this gets a little tougher now. Do you think 
anyone else thought of you as one who radiates any of these character traits? These are questions that I'm asking myself, okay? Um, you know, am I reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in my everyday life where it can be seen and heard by me? One of my best buddies at CCBS, Bistone, said it this way. He wrote this in my yearbook. He said, this year has been one of the greatest in my life. I discovered that the word is really a sword like it says. It really does a lot of heavy surgery on our attitudes and character. The word is powerful. And hopefully it has an impact on us. And then a second takeaway. At the beginning of this message, I told you about a guy on a bus who said, well, what does a Christian look like? And I really did, um, at that time when I first heard that, um, I really did think about it a lot. At that time, this was in when we were at Miami Christian College. And at that time, I was, I was um, guitar songs and, and lyric and stuff. And, and so I, I answer somehow um, in a song, well, what does a Christian look like? And so this, this song was the result. I'll just read you the lyrics. Just think about it. So what does a Christian look like? Well, his way is sure and steady as every step he takes. His bad days and his good days seem the same. And the one whose name he claims is plainly seen in his life. When all around is anger, his words are calm and sweet and reflects the peace he knows. And the one whose name he claims is plainly seen in his life. And all he does is for someone else. He says he's lost in knowing he's been found. He's been found by his Lord. You know, he shouts that name of Jesus without whispering a word. The fragrance that he bears is not his own. It's the one whose name he claims, and it's plainly seen in his life. What is it we said earlier? Many people will never read the Bible, but they read us daily. And so I ask myself, are those lyrics a portrayal of me? Do they describe me? Do they describe you? Brothers and sisters, to the extent that they are, God is glorified. To the extent that you and I are an authentic disciple of Christ, he is glorified. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's just thank the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your powerful word. We thank you for being able to just dig into it and to hear what you have for us to learn. We thank you, Lord, that for this moment when disciples and a crowd was gathered to hear you teach, in some sense, for the first time. We thank you for the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. We thank